Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Cognitive Dissidence. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. I'm a partner and the director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Joining me on the podcast for the third time is Matthew Pines. Um, He is a management consultant at Krebs Stamos, but he is here in a personal capacity. Um, In the past, Matt and I have talked about cybersecurity and U.S.-China relations. And while we spend a few opening minutes discussing some recent development in U.S.-China cyber relations, I brought, Mac on, uh, I brought Matt back on the podcast because I had promised in the last podcast that I would let him talk for more than five minutes about UFOs or UAPs or aliens, whatever word you want to put in there. And I have to admit, I've, I've done a lot of research over the past couple of weeks preparing for this podcast. And uh, you'll, as you'll hear in the podcast, I'm not willing to tell you that there are aliens out there, that there's some huge US conspiracy or cover up. But something is weird about this. Um, It is weird the level of political activity that's happening in the United States around this topic, and it opens itself up to speculation. So we try to do that in a reasoned and rigorous way and talk about what we do know, what we don't know, why some of these things are happening politically, and also letting ourselves um, go into a scenario analysis mode, which is, well, what if this is true? What does that look like? And also with some methodological considerations about how to think about something that is such a big tail risk that is probably so unlikely to be true, but... You know, which you can't deny there are these these facets about um, so i hope you enjoy the episode um, if you want to hear more about the research and advisory services that we offer at cognitive investments or if you want to learn more about how to invest with us or get access to our wealth management strategies it's jacob at cognitive.investments if you haven't rated or reviewed the podcast please consider doing so otherwise enough from me cheers and see you out there Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor. Um, before we get there, and this is not a bait and switch listeners, I just I would be remiss if I didn't do just five minutes of US-China stuff off the bat, in part because there was that big New York Times article this weekend about how China has malware and a bunch of US power infrastructure and things like that. They're purging the PLA rocket force, like there, but are ties between the US and China getting better? Cause it looks like the White House is walking back some of the restrictions. So I'll let you riff on any or all of the above. I just wanted to get your take specifically on that scary story about Chinese malware being in our power infrastructure and more generally how you're feeling about US China relations. Yes, and that was an important story, if not surprising. Um, you know, the details I think uh, were surprising to the mass audience, but from a just deterrence and compellence perspective, it's fully in keeping with PLA doctrine that they would want to um, achieve persistence on networks that would give them the ability to either credibly deter the United States from intervening in a Taiwan conflict scenario, and if the United States does does decide to intervene, the ability to sort of compel us or degrade our ability to sort of mobilize our capabilities um, and generally gum up the works uh, domestically and you know potentially change the political calculations um, at home. So not surprising. Um, I think there's a reason why it was sort of pu- published when it was published is you know, there's been a lot of kind of digging around uh, domestically to try to find these types of um, penetrations. If you recall, there was a story a few months ago about um, Volt Typhoon, which was a PLA attributed mm-hmm. actor that had conducted similar operations focused on Guam, but other other parts of what you could call critical infrastructure, telecommunications and other other uh, other elements of kind of civilian infrastructure that would support military operations. So this is sort of broadening the aperture from that particular story, but it's 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 uh, keeping into the theme. And I would have to say, you know, not not considered at least from our perspective, a like an attack or a an actual um, you know escalation, but what you would expect to be kind of a prudent prepositioning, given where the relationship is. Um, you know, one one potential scenario, right? This is more speculative, is you know thinking about where the PLA can can achieve, you know, relative strategic um, advantages where they can continue to kind of like keep their population relatively um, con- controlled if, if, if our retaliation for civilian infrastructure attacks domestically via cyber um, enabled means 
you know, hits them, you know, it's not as much of a big deal domestically. Whereas for us, we need Netflix, we need air travel, we need we need the basics to, to keep functioning before people go, you know, we're going to we're going to rise up. And so uh, it's a smart strategy. It's what you would expect. Um, I think the United States is drawing a specific attention to it as part of this large di- sort of diplomatic um, tension that I think you're seeing inside D.C. between two different camps. There's kind of the engagement camp and the like, you know, escalation containment camp. Um, and they've sort of waxed and waned over the past you know, year or so, um, especially as we saw kind of an, a, a nadir reached post uh, October 7th semiconductor controls and then the Blinken visit being canceled after the balloon mm-hmm. incident. And there was a general perception of kind of a security dilemma deterioration that I think really spooked you know, big money <laughs> and and uh, sort of p- parts of the U.S. political economy that were not happy with the direction of travel of U.S.-China relations. And and then if you notice, there was this, a flurry of, of senior level visits, um, starting in the private sector principally. You had Elon Musk, you had Jamie Dimon, you had um, Bill Gates, you had um, Sam Altman, you had like a whole host of folks, you know, not official government representatives going over there to kind of like keep bridges, uh, you know, open. Um, and then the CIA director, Bill Burns, did a clandestine visit, I think, in May. And that set the groundwork for a whole more, a whole series of more official engagements. Secretary Yellen, um, most importantly, after Secretary Blinken, that tried to put a floor, quote unquote, under the relationship, which I think thus far, I think they've been successful at. I think there's a strategic desire on both sides to, um, you know, prevent uh, something from spiraling out of control. You know, President Xi has his own, you know, house to kind of clean up both economically as well as he has certain, I think, political objectives inside the bureaucracy now that he's kind of come out of the um, the party congress with a renewed kind of internal mandate. And now he's executing on that mandate and he's, you know, doing some pretty dramatic reshuffling as we've seen in the, you know, the foreign ministry and now in the rocket forces. He's trying to consolidate control with loyalists and then, as you know, you know, sometimes you uh, you run across, uh, you know, cases like um, uh, like the foreign minister where, you know, stuff happens inside the, 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 the CCP bureaucracy and everyone's yeah. just kind of guessing. Uh, well, I, but, I, thought yeah, he was a, I thought he was a loyalist. Apparently not. So. I mean, there's lots of. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine there's there's probably like two people in the world that know like like the true story of that. Um, yeah. And one of them probably will never talk again. Um and yeah, so I think that's where we are now. I think there's, an, there's a desire, at least on a political level, to try to get things back to an even keel, maybe get to a point where there can be a, really, a meeting between the two leaders um, later this year, like in November. Um, we'll see if that, if that happens. Um, but I think they're, they want to try to keep, keep you know, anything that could throw a monkey wrench into that um, off the table, which is why I think they're trying to soften or slow roll some of these maneuvers while also placating kind of that domestic like decoupling lobby. So the executive order on outbound investment screening, um, which essentially the reverse CFIUS, which should be coming out, you know, imminently first week of August. It's already kind of been reported. It's on the president's desk waiting to be signed. You know, we'll, we'll be pretty limited and narrow in scope and targeting kind of early stage investments in like AI, semiconductors and quantum information sciences. And I think, you know, this won't be a great, I expect it to be like signed or released on like a Friday afternoon, right? Like, I don't think the government, I don't think the White House will be like drawing too much attention to it, um, uh, which I think would be is, is a different messaging shift than they, than they had done back in the October 7th controls when, you know, the National Security Advisor gave like a whole speech and it was like, this is the center, the centerpiece of a new kind of strategic orientation for techno-industrial competition with China. And, um, you know, that, that was perceived by Beijing as like a, almost like declaration of economic war. And it was like, all right, the gloves are off now. Um, and I think things might have gotten a little bit out of, out of hand uh, earlier, early in the spring. Um, but, you know, we're only one accident away from all that coming unglued, right? One, one drone crashing into one of our spy planes or fighter jet crashing into the, one of our one of our spy planes or um, some confrontation in the South China Sea between, you know, a frigate and, our, and, a, and a destroyer. And then, you know, you're in you're in bad news land. Last question before we leave this. Um, so, you know, Chinese malware in U.S. infrastructure systems. Are we doing this to them as well? Like, do, are, are there two equivalents of us doing a Chinese podcast talking about this on their side, being like, oh, the U.S. has, like, infiltrated the Three Gorges Dam, and if there's a war in Taiwan, they're going to shut everything down? Like, do we have that kind of offensive capability that we're employing, to your knowledge? 
I mean, the details are, of course, classified. I, I mean, aware of that the U.S. Cyber Command has a doctrine called persistent engagement and defend forward, which is predicated on being in the adversary's networks to maintain persistence so that if the commander chief gives the order to disrupt or degrade those networks, that they can do that effectively. And in a modern, you know, sort of war planning scenario, you know, there's sort of general like rules of engagement, like what's considered like a viable target for any military operation. And, you know, in general, there's like a set of decision criteria, right? Like pure military targets are usually considered kosher. And then there's like ambiguous gray zone targets, right? That might be considered enabling infrastructure for military, military operations. And there's always like a cost benefit calculation of what are the spillover effects to say civilian population, life and safety, sort of collateral damage that goes into those, you know, assessments about whether uh, those are permissible targets under different, you know, sort of battlefield conditions. And so, but as a matter of like having capabilities to execute, right, you would expect that the cyber command would have, would want to have the capabilities to, you know, disrupt and degrade, you know, Chinese infrastructure, you know, when and if ordered in a, in a conflict. Which is what yeah. we saw the PLA doing here. Is like we want to have access to those networks. We want to be able to maintain persistence so that if you know the, their commander gives the order, they can you know effectively disrupt them. Hmm. Um, when you said military targets are kosher, I, I'm now thinking of the kosh root of military targets and hoping that my years spent in yeshiva can actually be used in some kind of analysis that is worthwhile now, but probably not. Um, it, let's it is, move. I mean, well, one last point. It is very. Yeah. It's a much more um, complex thing than say like like. Like like bomb, sort of bombing targets, right? Where it's like, okay, mm-hmm. hospital off limits, school off limits, churches off limits, you know, military headquarters, good to go, right? There's like a clear delineation that you're only going to find, and you can contain the damage. The nature of cyber attacks is you're degrading kind of enabling infrastructure that's like fundamentally dual, like dual use, right? Like transportation infrastructure, communications infrastructure, and you can't exactly know ahead of time what all those spillover effects are going to be, right? Like whether you've just like basically cut off the power to that hospital and now an entire, you know, ward of babies is going to have like, you know, major health problems, right? Because you just like, you know, yeah. killed this, like the life-sustaining functions of the hospital. And that is a very complicated decision. I think in general, like my expectation is that we would probably be a little bit more he- hesitant to expand the target, the targeting range than China would be. But, you know, when you're in a full-scale conflict and it's about, you know, something as existential as a fight over Taiwan, potentially, it could get quite messy. Yeah. Um, all right, let's move to the main topic of conversation. Um, I've done some reading and some research. I'm, I'm still very skeptical, but maybe, maybe let's start here. Let's just talk about what's happened in the last week or so, and then maybe we can zoom out and give some macro perspective and get down to some of the questions. So mm-hmm. maybe you, because um, do you want to sort of set up what this congressional hearing about is it UAPs is the politically correct term, right? I'm not supposed to say UFOs anymore. People are getting very, very sensitive about how you how you call these things. But talk a little bit about the congressional hearing and what we learned or what was different or was anything surprising to you there? Yes. Uh, yeah. UAP is the official term of art in, in, in government parlance. But of course, in pop culture, it's UFO. And they mean it the same thing. And even in the statutory language that was just passed, the National Defense Authorization Act, where they define UAPs as unidentified anomalous phenomenon, they like helpfully put in like what we mean by that. And they mean flying saucer, flying discs, un- unidentified <laughs> flying objects, right? Like they, they explicitly reference what are the sort of semantic categories that they mean to cover by by the term UAP. So there's, you know, no, no ambiguity in what the law 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 is intended to, to be scoped to. Um, but that is, uh, yeah, so a good segue to the summary of the most recent events as this sort of has broken through a little bit into the mainstream, kind of the Overton window of what we consider kind of, you know, official policy discourse. You know, I think UAPs and UFOs were sort of clearly outside that Overton window. And it's like, they're kind of knocking on the window, right? They're kind of like, like kind of maybe, maybe coming inside. They're just kind of on, on, on the precipice here. Um, and so we saw a hearing in the House Oversight Committee where they had two witnesses, uh, both former um, uh, naval aviators, as well as one uh, whistleblower from the, uh, the intelligence community. And I think his testimony is the most explosive and potentially controversial. Um, that's like the specific allegations that the U.S. government has had crash retrieval and reverse engineering programs of non-Earth origin exotic technology, you know, that's not of human origin. 
for decades, um, and that we have recovered, quote, biologics associated with those crash retrievals, and that we have a very kind of closely held and potentially illegal set of special access programs that have evaded congressional oversight and that have funded themselves like illicitly through manipulation of federal acquisition regulations, IRAD programs, um, and other means of uh, kind of um, uh, sort of financial shenanigans. And so this is sort of the core allegation that was surfaced at the hearing the, you know, under oath in, in the presence of, of the members of Congress's questioning. Um, and it comes in the context of other official um, statements by members of Congress, specifically members of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence over the past few weeks and months, um, as well as more importantly, from my perspective, pieces of legislation, actual text in bills that the Senate has now passed as of last week uh, July 27th in the um, combined National Defense Authorization Act, Intelligence Authorization Act. And that is a particular, you know, more revealing to me of what might be happening here um, that needs to be analyzed in light of what David Grush um, alleged in, in his testimony. Um, very wild claims, like very, like basically David Grush was essentially um, you know, putting weight behind like the core of like the whole multi-decade kind of cultural conspiracy about Roswell and that alien craft have actually been recovered and that the U.S. government has been keeping it a secret and that they've been actively trying to sort of um, disenfranchise public opinion was the words uh, that David Grush used. Um, and so this is kind of like a pretty high stakes claim that is being made by someone with prima facie professional bona fides, like he was a very senior uh, intelligence official in the National Reconnaissance Office, National Judicial Intelligence Agency. He uh, was responsible for helping to put together the president's daily brief um, on behalf of the director of the National Reconnaissance Office. And in that role, he had exceptionally broad access to um, the Defense Department's uh, special access programs. And it was because of that broad access and his experience as a as an intelligence official with uh, responsibilities expanding into the UAP portfolio, he was tapped in 2019 to be the UAP t task force representative from uh, the, the, uh, the, the, I think it was the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Mm -hmm. And so he was sort of in this role for about three or four years where he was tasked as a result of congressional pressure on the Defense Department to stand up this task force to go and figure out what does the Defense Department know about these UAP stuff? Right. And so he did his job. He's like, all right, this is my job. I now have all the tickets, which is in sort of class in DOD parlance. Like I have like the clearances to get access to all these different compartmented programs. And now he has the need to know being this official, having this official position as the co-lead on this task force. And so he went out and conducted a whole bunch of interviews and and, and, and collected documentation uh, that, according to him, you know, revealed to him the existence of these covert programs that were being conducted um, outside of uh congressional oversight. And that is kind of where we stand now with those claims. Um, that's David Grush's claims. We can pivot it, but you know, I'll let you pause there. But then, then there's like the legislation piece, which I think needs its own analysis. Yeah, we can, we can shift there too. I mean, I, I would just point like, you know, after Grush made all of those comments, Sean Kirkpatrick, who's the director of, of AARO, put mm -hmm. out his own statement, but in his personal capacity, not in his sort of official capacity. Um, and I guess it was trying to to delegitimize all the things that had come out in the hearing, but when you actually, and, and that was sort of the newspaper articles came out, oh, Kirkpatrick d does this, and the Pentagon spokesperson says this, but when you actually read the letter, I mean, he says, I'm deeply disappointed that AARO has been denigrated, blah, 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 but the only sentence in there about like refuting the claims is, AARO has yet to find any credible evidence to support the allegations of any reverse engineering program for non-human technology. That's it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, like, that's a pretty, so, for, for that's not denying that there's for example biologics that the government mm -hmm. is hiding it also is just have not found any credible evidence i mean it's about as mealy mouth a denial as you could possibly mm -hmm. get so when you start to pull back the end like i don't know what kirkpatrick was doing there to me he just opened up more questions rather than actually delegitimizing the, the hearing and um yeah and I, and I guess that's the other thing here I'm, I'm struck by two different things there is the there are aliens little you know child bodies and metallic objects that the government is hiding versus there are government programs and government funding that is going to investigate a bunch of stuff that nobody knows about. I'm very willing to believe that the latter is happening. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to need a lot more evidence to, uh, to believe that the former is happening, but it's not like Kirkpatrick's letter in some ways made me stop and start thinking about this even more seriously when I feel like the, in, the intent was the opposite. 
Yeah, and I, it's quite, re- you know, if this if there was nothing here, it'd be a very straightforward thing to have like a pretty comprehensive and blanket denial of the yeah. substance of these claims. And yet, time after time, whether it's Kirkpatrick or Susan Goh, who's the, who's the DOD director, um, sorry, who's the DOD kind of public affairs spokesman for this, or even the White House, which basically has the exact same talking points from from Susan Goh's office, they like very, they, they're very like weaselly worded, right? Which tell, tell it's like, it's very odd to me. I'm like, it should be very easy to just have a blanket statement that's like, no, US government has no knowledge, awareness of, or has no programs at all relating to non-human origin tech, advanced technology. Just like put it there. Instead, they have these like credible evidence of extraterrestrial technology, which is like, that implies, and I think David Grush even said this in his testimony, like he's, extraterrestrial implies we like, is it, like is it, there's a known origin. We know it's from this this, you know, from Alpha Centauri or whatever. And, you know, unless it comes with a sticker on it that says made in, you know, made off planet, right? Like, <laughs> what would be credible evidence of extraterrestrial? So it's like, it's setting the bar extremely high, but making it, but writing it in the context that implies it's like a fundamental um, uh, denial of the core claim, which, as you, as you mentioned, being a, you know, fellow philosopher, uh, undergrad, you know, paying attention to the specific semantics is important in these things. Um, which tells me, okay, it's important to pay attention to the subtext here, right? What is not being said when they're saying these things? Um, and importantly, what's the role of Arrow in this whole process? Which is mm-hmm. something the Senate, the Senate was, and the Senate's like an intelligence is like they are the most important, you know, actor in this whole this whole drama, right? Like they're at the center of this uh, because it was their legislation that created Arrow in the first place. It was it's their uh, you know skiffs that all these witnesses, including David Grush, have gone to to give this testimony alleging the existence of these programs. And so if you look over the past two to three years, the pattern that I observe is, um, you know, things happening out of, out of view, and then the Senate Secretary of Intelligence passes, I think almost every single time, unanimously, a set of UAP-related provisions to include in the either the NDAA or the IAA that um, require the official reporting of UAP related um, uh, you know, identifications and reports to Congress and to the public, mandate a whole bunch of historical reviews of the US government's you know, uh, you know, efforts on this going back to 1945. And every NDA that's been passed, they've sort of ratcheted up the scope and intensity of the legislative requirements on this issue, which is like a trend that's worth noticing. It's like over the past two or three years, as the Senate selecting intelligence, like probably the most important element of our of our congressional oversight structure for you know the most secret programs we have, has not been treating this with the mis- with like dismissal or like as a casual side project. Like they've only gotten more and more serious, and the legislative um, maneuvers that they've engaged in have only gotten more and more expansive uh, over time. Um, and so I see, you know, that's like indirect evidence that like wh- whatever is motivating that must be sufficiently strong to get, you know, on a bipartisan basis, the entire Slavic Slavian intelligence to unanimously approve these quite eye-opening pieces of, of, of bill text. And then to have them be incorporated without objection into larger packages that are now passed by the larger Congress and signed by the president. And that's, that's happened for two consecutive National Defense Authorization Act. And I think we've reached kind of like a culmination point with this most recent NDA, um, which has some just absolute, just like jaw dropping language in it, right? Like if people actually read what their representatives are putting into law, it is, it's kind of almost insanity inducing, right? Like, like they actually have language defining like what technologies of, of, of unknown origin means. And if you look at it, it just says the term technologies of unknown origin means any materials or metamaterials, ejecta, crash debris, mechanisms, machinery, equipment, assemblies or subassemblies, da 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 da, intact aerospace vehicles, damaged or intact ocean service undersea, pheno- uh, undersea craft associated with uh, UAP or incorporating science and technology that lacks prosaic attribution or known means of human manufacture. And there's another provision uh, that actually restricts funding to any unreported special access program and it defines like basically the, those sorts of programs as as basically any um, uh, any activities related to UAPs uh, including capturing recovering or securing UAP craft or components of this craft analyzing them for the purpose of determining properties material composition managing or finding security for those uh, for those materials reverse engineering and replicating their technology 
the development of quote propulsion technology or aerospace craft that uses propulsion technology systems or subsystems that is based on or derived from or inspired by inspection analysis reverse engineering of recovered UAP and then any aerospace craft that uses propulsion technology other than chemical propellant solar power or electronic ion thrust and then they have a separate section which is the real crazy part which is like they have to turn over to the director of aero and then he has to notify congress within 30 days all such um, basically a list a comprehensive list of quote all non-earth origin or exotic unidentified anomalous phenomenon material so the words non-earth origin or exotic unidentified anomalous material are now in the Senate passed NDAIA that's supposed to go to the president's desk once it gets merged with the House version um, in in the fall, which is like, I don't know, but like, that's crazy to me, right? <laughs> like, why would that be? Uh, oh, and this is the kicker. So I'll finish with, with this one, because this is the one that is just really like, you know, nuts. So the term non-human intelligence, I think, appears 22 times in the sh- the the package of the language that the majority leader of the Senate, Senator Schumer, introduced a co-sponsor with Senator Rounds, and it was co-sponsored by many other bipartisan members of the House of, of the Senate, including the Senate Armed Services Committee and Senate Select Committee Intelligence. It's like 60 pages of, le- of legislation that is designed, unlike the SS- SSCI introduced provisions, which were designed to basically like much more narrowly, like kind of like hit these rogue special access programs that are alleged who have been conducting reverse engineering of these retrieved um, uh, you know, non-Earth origin exotic technologies. That's the SSCI interest provisions, which are relatively short, narrowly scoped. The Schumer bill basically is like literally called the UAP Disclosure Act. And it's like 60 pages of very like tightly written congressional text. Like it's got all the lawyer typical congressional stuff in it. Clearly they had a bunch of staffers working on this for a long time. And it was, it was introduced kind of completely by surprise. It didn't come out of a committee. It didn't come out of like a pattern of like hearings or they bring in witnesses. It was just like the Senate majority leader is just like, oh, okay, guys, I'm going to drop this like UAP disclosure bill. And I'm going to have, it basically sets up like a, com- a commission to officially collect all the UAP related records in the government um, that exist. And it gives this commission the status of a federal agency and powers of subpoena and like blanket, blanket ability to basically ask for any document material or anything basically that at all relates to UAPs and they have a very like whole set of provisions to like define what that really means in terms of non-human intelligence related technologies of unknown origin like it's in the law to set up a nine member commission appointed by that by the president that's that are senate confirmed positions that are that that will have tenure through 2030 seven year term um and basically set up like a JFK style review commission to officially collect and then selectively decide to disclose to the public these UAP records with the goal of informing the public of the federal government's historical involvement with UAPs going back, you know, as long as as long as those records exist. And in the I just I, I don't want to like the labor of the point, but like the legislation to me is like way more important than even David Grush. David Grush is very important to me, but like it's firsthand hearsay. He's making these claims, very strong claims under oath, um, but he hasn't brought forward, you know, what I would consider dispositive evidence. Like, it's very important to investigate his claims, give the Congress the authority to go and knock on the door of the whatever Lockheed facility the stuff is supposed to be in, open the door. Is it there or is it not there? Like, I don't know. What, but where that rubber meets the road is like actually having the tangible authorities to do that. And that's actually what these bills are designed to do. Because one of the provisions in the Schumer bill is, gives the government a claim of eminent domain over any non-Earth origin, exotic technology, technology of unknown origin associated with non-human intelligence <laughs> to claim for the, for the federal government to basically repossess under its, under its eminent domain authorities for the, for the public good any of those technologies that might be held in private aerospace, essentially. This is what's written into the law that was just passed by the Senate last week. And I'm just like, you know, that to me is just like, mind-boggling right like and this hasn't been reported like every every mention i've seen of the schumer bill is just to become more transparent with the public on uaps it's just like a one-line throwaway because i don't think people have actually read the text of the bill it's quite dense but if you read it it's it's kind of it's kind of insane uh like this is basically the government at least the senate um you know coming out and basically saying yeah we're pretty sure there are these things 
that we would that we are we need we need to designate as being covered by the terms technology of unknown origin and that relate to quote non-human intelligence and they have like a whole definition of what that means and it's it's basically yeah aliens is what they're saying it's like <laughs> I, and I, I guess people haven't quite picked up on it yet um yeah this is the part i was looking for this is in this is in the text that was just passed last week non-human intelligence section 13 the term non-human intelligence means any sentient intelligent non-human life form regardless of nature or ultimate origin that may be presumed responsible for unidentified anomalous phenomena or of which the federal government has become aware. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I laughed, I laughed because when you said eminent domain over alien technology, the hubris of a government saying, yes, this, this alien technology, we will just, we will just claim under, under eminent domain. There's something so rich about that. And I think it's important to dwell, because you're right, there's the politics and then there's the aliens. And I think we'll get to the aliens a little bit later. But the politics of this is so strange because, I mean, you mentioned it, but I think it's, I think it deserves underscoring. So it's Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York with Mike Rounds, Republican from South Dakota with Marco Rubio, Republican from Florida, Kristen Gillibrand, Democrat from New York. Then you've got a Senate Republican from Indiana, you know, Democrat from New Mexico. We can't get gun control in this country. We can't get education. We can't get infrastructure. We can't get nuclear reactors built. But we can somehow, everybody can say, oh, we're going to stop calling each other fascists for five minutes here. Well, probably more than five minutes and come up with this really, really intricate bill because everybody, Republicans and Democrats, needs to get on board with, with understanding this. And I don't know whether that's just, is that bread and circuses? Do they know that this is like a like a thing that's going to distract from their complete and utter incompetence in both houses, which is how I would describe it. Or is it like they actually know something? Do they feel like they're being subverted? I don't know. And the last part of this is I can't help. I don't know if she was a congresswoman or a senator, but, you know, the, that hearing where she stopped the questioning to ask what a substack was. The idea that we've got, you know, like like these like, you know, people who don't even know what a substack is, they're going to be claiming eminent domain over non-human technology like I. I don't even know how to process all of this. <laughs> no, I, I, I wouldn't expect anyone to try to process this or put in, into any sort of coherence. And I think one thing we should try to do is try to resist the need to try to impose prematurely some coherent narrative to this. Because mm. at first blush, it just resists that. And I don't think you should try to force one onto it, whether it's the psyop distraction or even if it's the you know ultimate underlying truth of you know you know hiding non non Earth origin exotic technology like it could be very complicated and I think there could be many overlapping motives by many different you know actors at play because you could have like the sort of sci fi plot and then overlay that the normal bureaucratic plots of people trying to protect interest seizing a public issue for their own for their own you know aggrandizement just pure old greed i want that i want this technology i don't want anyone else to have it yeah. um and so i think in general what you would expect isn't like the hollywood trope uh what you would expect even if this is like the sci-fi core plot you would expect there to be just the overlapping normal bureaucratic and you know human nonsense right that goes along with it which makes it very hard to disentangle right like what's going on because it seems to just be a messy complicated um beast where the folks that I tra I pay a lot of attention to, the like like the the, the weather vanes in this, um, aren't necessarily you know I give them credit right as far as it goes whether it's Representative Burchett or Luna these folks in the House but honestly they're on the outside looking in and they saw this as an issue to get you know to sort of wield get their moment in the sun and you know they got the hearing and I think it was a very important hearing um, but let's be honest they're not at the center of the official. Um, maneuvers behind the scenes when it comes to the introduction of this language, which is being driven by an entirely other set of stakeholders, mostly in the Senate, um, who, you know, they are very solemn and serious. And the language in the bill is very, very serious. Um, and that makes it very hard to reconcile with a normal approach to the circus of politics in D.C., which, generally speaking, does not seem all that serious. Um, and, yeah, I mean, one of the points that is... Um, what was remarkable to me was was Representative Gallagher. Um, he, you know, of course, he's uh, the chair of the China Select Committee. Um, new, you know, not really. He's a relatively new, um, up and coming Republican, kind of moderate Republican, defense hawkish kind of guy. Probably has presidential aspirations. Marine intelligence officer, PhD, kind of checks all those boxes from Wisconsin. 
he went on a syndicated kind of um, sports uh, podcast talk talk show, which has like you know, it's like one of the it's the Pat McAfee show. It's like you know, everyone watches it for like you know, like NFL draft picks and stuff. <laughs> and they invite they invite him on, um, and he's got like a 40, 45 minute segment a few weeks ago, and it's explicitly designed you know to set him up to talk about UAPs the entire time. It's just the NFL guys basically talking to him about aliens. And so here's a guy who otherwise has a pretty serious portfolio, right? Like, and he's like, you know, his main, you know, issue du jour has been China competition, you know, CCP bad, you know, kind of prepare for Taiwan war, get them, get, get them ready. You know, that's like his, been his thing. And now he's like, spends 45 minutes just talking about UAPs on this, like, sort of, you know, you know, basically the flyover country. Um, and he explicitly said his objective is to try to normalize this 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 subject. Um, and he went there in coordination with an interview that Marco Rubio had just done the day before, where Marco Rubio basically kind of nodded at the the whistleblower claims, and saying these are very serious, and that some of these witnesses are feeling are fearing incredibly for their lives as a result of having to as a result of having come to the Senate Select Committee Intelligence and you know given um, given estimate uh, give, given evidence and testimony um, of these programs. Um, and so they're taking it very seriously. But Gallagher. Who you know is kind of goes on this on this talk radio show to explicitly try to normalize this subject. Basically says he needs to get he wants to get it into the presidential conversation. So I I just look at all this and I see there's like an apparatus, there's kind of this superstructure trying to be formed um, to allow politicians to more officially engage with the subject, right? And you can you can see there's like an invisible superstructure that's being laid. Um, First, by, by by people in you know positions of credibility, but it's like an inch, you know, building the bridges and building that superstructure kind of inch by inch, and then getting this commission stood up, and this is like the more formal kind of like, okay, now we're gonna start to roll things out. Now, what does that all mean? Like until they come and show me, you know, the technologies of unknown origin, right? Like again, it's all it's all circumstantial inference, right? Um, but it's quite a bizarre one. It's quite it's quite a bizarre one. It's like you know, to what end, right? Is this all happening? Um, it makes, it makes, makes one has to sort of p- at least pay attention. I don't think you can ignore this. No, I don't think you can ignore it either, even though, I mean, I was very, very skeptical at first, but I've come around to your position that we at least need to be talking about it. I, I keep on thinking about, um, the brothers Karamazov and the grand inquisitor mm-hmm. chapter, and that maybe they have an alien like somewhere in the, in the bowels of the Pentagon. And they're like, you know, I've come to bring peace and unlimited power to mankind. And they're like, that's great. But like, you can't, you just have to sit here in this dungeon and we'll like feed you cheese. It's or something like that until we're ready for you. Um, but I, I think that is a good segue because there is all this weird, there's all this weird stuff. Like we're seeing all this, these political machinations. We've got all these stories. You've got investigative journalists, um, like, uh, I'm, who wrote in plain sight, Ross, uh, uh Ross Coulthard, Coulthard, like, you know, making all these claims, it's well-researched, it's backed up all these other things, but you know, there's no alien craft. There is like, there's no actual evidence. And I actually went down a rabbit hole here. I mean, I sort of went back to Roswell, I was seeing like newspapers from the late 1940s. Like, here's a headline. This could have been written, you know, just the other day. But more flying saucers seen as men of science ponder serious angles. And then here's a whole article by the Associated Press in 1947, which is basically just a recap of like what's going on um, right now. I even found um, Richard Russell when he was traveling in the Soviet Union, mm-hmm. senator from my state of Georgia. Very complicated man, whatever, but a very, very powerful U.S. senator who claimed to see UFOs on a train ride somewhere in like outside of Baku and the Soviets covered up the windows and wouldn't let, let, let them look outside because he saw these two discs and it made it into a declassified CIA cable. So when you start to pull back the onion, um, you, know, you see all these, it's all this innuendo and all of these mealy mouth statements and we need this evidence, but we don't have this evidence. We need this commission and blah, blah, blah. Um, but to your point, like, I mean, do, like, like, there's an answer somewhere. Like, does this shit exist or not? And I don't understand why it's so hard. And I, you know, part of the, you know, you were mentioning philosophy earlier. Like, if if this thing does exist, like, would would it really stay secret for that long? Like, if somebody had their hands on this, like, I assume that it would be out. And I don't think that we would all start eating each other alive if we knew that somebody had visited the planet from somewhere else. I don't know. It's just very, I get like, 85% of the way there, but then the fact that, you know, since time immemorial, we have no actual evidence. It is all just this kind of hysteria and, and that, I don't know, it, it's hard to sort of make it that last step. So I agree with, like, when you look at the politics, when you look at 
all the scurrying around, it makes you think there's got to be, there's too much smoke for there not to be some kind of fire. But if the fire were actually, we have an alien body in the bottom of the Pentagon, like I can't imagine that would be still be secret, you know? Well, again, I, I've held, I've held uh, TSSCI clearances before. I don't have any active clearances. I've never actually... I've never been ax- I never had any firsthand access to these alleged programs. I'll put that down for the record. Um, uh, but there are secrets the government has kept for a long time that are, you know, that have never gotten out, right? Like, the government can keep secrets, right? Especially in this world of special access programs. Like, the stuff we've seen leaked from Snowden, it's like, those were pretty compartmented stuff. But when you get into, like, the, the SAP world, especially the unacknowledged and wave SAP world for like defense and even atomic, like the Department of Energy in particular, like that stuff is a black hole. Um, and so like there is an apparatus that's quite effective at protecting certain things. Um, and the allegations though have been that this has leaked. It's just been effectively manipulated through a very sophisticated disinformation campaign where, yeah, maybe as part of those like, you know, the, the decades of UFO lore, some bits of truth have filtered out. You know, but it's been surrounded by a miasma of disinformation and made up kooky nonsense. And because you don't have the inside you know, track, you don't know what's true from not. And so mm-hmm. it, it's there, but no one knows and adversaries don't know either. Right. And so it's effectively a kind of way of mixing the truth in with a bunch of lies. And, you know, no one no one's the wiser. Um, there's another potential factor here, which among any other secret you could imagine being quite compelling for the for those briefed into the secret to keep it a secret right which is maybe it's not all that great news right like like it's not something you would just want to tell people because it might not be such a good conversation to have and you would rather have not known about it in the first place and so it's just not something you want to say right it's not like oh cool like we're teleporting ourselves to mars to have meet to have have tea with the alpha centauri whatever right like i i I, I got a crazy bar story for you buddy no this is like one where you go home and you just drink yourself into a stupor right like it could be that type of secret right which would be very effective at sort of um uh self-containing right uh and you know that that that's if you're if you're in the branch of the bayesian tree where not him where these uaps represent non-human intelligence right like there's kind of three possibilities right it's like like benevolent benign kind of neutral and then like hostile right you know and you can kind of just examine this like purely kind of um a priori right if if you're granting the assumption that they're real and they're they're here for some reason the fact that they've been around here for a while and let you know hiroshima happen let the holocaust happen let decades of wars and almost nuclear you know exchanges happen tells us tells me at least they don't care too much about intervening to save us from murdering each other at scale, right? So, like, their threshold for benevolence is pretty high. Right? We haven't quite met the level where they would intervene to make us all live in a utopia, right? Um, now, they obviously haven't wiped us out, so they're not, like, super aggressively, you know, um, you know, like hostile. But that kind of leaves this pretty broad, ambiguous, ambiguous, you know, middle ground, where if you assume they're real... You know, you have to stipulate some variation of, of assumption behind their their intention. And it's clearly not, you know, entirely benevolent, um, at least the historical evidence would say. So that could be a reason why it's state secret. The other reason is um, going back to more like physics. And the, the more I'd say solid speculation, if this is true, would be when we like the lesson of World War Two was that new physics kind of wins great power war. Right. Like it was this sort of synergistic integration of leading scientists, physicists, mainly mathematicians and computer scientists or the predecessors of computer scientists of the day, cryptographers that banded together with institutional bureaucracies wedded to the military and intelligence complex that won World War II. And that that institutional structure and power arrangement did just like disappear after 1945. Right. In fact, it was extremely empowered um, to sort of reconstruct the post-war technological order. Um, And. If you imagine that some part of that some part of that structure um, came across super advanced non human technology, like they would treat the potential physics knowledge gained from that technology as equivalent to, if not more important strategically than the physics knowledge they gained from nuclear physics to turn into a nuclear weapon. That they created an entire separate compartment of secrecy for, right? They created Department of Energy, you know, the, like the Q clearance, restricted data. There's a whole Atomic Energy Act specifically designed to protect physics knowledge from being weaponized. So if you figured out there's maybe this potential source of new physics knowledge that could be weaponized, but in a much more, you know, dangerous fashion, then you would you would treat that, you know, as if not more secretly than you treat, you know, nuclear 
you know, weapon secrets, which we treat exceptionally secretly. Um, so that would explain why you would have, you know, like the sort of compartments within compartments within compartments, and that maybe it's so secret off the books that certain people over many decades figure out, you know, they can kind of like separate from the normal like apparatus of government oversight, and that sort of feeds on itself over time. Um, and then now we're at this point where, uh oh. Like the, the like the rest of the government's waking up to the fact that maybe these maybe these secret programs have been running on kind of unsupervised <laughs> for decades, and now now that now that we're like coming into a strategic competition with China, it's time to like bringing them back under the fold a bit. Um, I don't know that's that that's speculation. Well, yeah, I hear you, but th- but then like then we get into the U.S. centric part of this conversation, which mm-hmm. is. If, if there are visitors here, like they aren't just chilling in like the United States, like you would assume the Soviets had their own program and the Chinese have their own program and everybody else has their own program. And like the Soviet Union collapsed, <laughs> like, like, the, like the, anybody who was going to hold the secrets there, like wouldn't have the secrets held. And you would think that there would be sort of broader conversations about this. But Well, actually, that did leak out. I mean, there was a journalist, George Knapp, who went to the Soviet Union after it collapsed and he got basically a whole trove of UAP related documents from Russia. Um, And they they were reported on, but no one really cared because it was, you know, a few scientists who came out of the Russian apparatus and said, here you go, we'll talk about it. And then after like a year or two, you know, that kind of um, perestroika, you know, ended and then they all got sucked back into the bureaucracy. Um, uh, So there's like a little window for a very brief period of time into, you know, what the Russians were doing on this, um, which has been alleged. And, and, you know, in the in the debrief article that um, featured David Grush's testimony, the journalist uh, Leslie Clean Ralph Blumenthal, um, Ralph, Ralph Blumenthal, also interviewed on the record um, by name a, uh, a a retired colonel who I believe was at NASIC, National Air Space um, uh, Intelligence Command, uh, and he basically confirmed Grush's allegations of there being a quote sub Rosa Cold War for decades, focused on essentially the competitive crash retrieval and reverse engineering of this advanced technology. And that Ross Colthar has similarly reported on the fact that there's an aggressive counterintelligence campaign um, operated by the Chinese in Huntsville, Alabama, where, you know, like a large part of our allegedly, you know, programs are, are located. Um, that's where a lot of the, you know, Operation Paperclip Nazi scientists went as <laughs> like building up the U.S. sort of rocket force. And, uh, you know, the kind of the second and third generation scientists that were trained by that first generation all stayed around Huntsville. And there's like a little nucleus of like really advanced physicists and rocket scientists there. Um, and uh, actually, there was a big fight to actually move Space Force to Huntsville that Biden just right. ruled to saw, yeah. Colorado. So like Huntsville, Alabama is like a locus. It's like a almost little like like mini rocket scientist uh, enclave there. Um, but there's apparently it's a hotbed of, of, of Chinese counterintelligence allegedly focused on trying to get access to some of these advanced propulsion system technologies, which may have a, an origin in some of these, you know, off book technology of unknown origin um, reverse engineering programs. So, you know, if you follow the storyline, it at least tells a consistent story, which is that. There has been, you know, intense great power competition over trying to get access to these technologies, which might be relatively rare. I don't know why they're crashing. You know, crashing is a loaded term. It could just be dropped there, right? It could just be given away, gifted. It could just be trash, one-time use sorts of things. Who knows? Uh, we have no idea that's putting yourselves in the minds of whatever the thing is operating this stuff or creating them. Um, but I think it's very weird, like, to first order that we now have these bills and in, in the Senate that are passed that say basically non-human intelligence materials and biological materials. Like, like why? Like, I, can someone ask Schumer, right? Like, why did you put this bill in there? What did you mean when you, when you wanted to like say the federal government shall exercise eminent domain over any and all recovered technologies of unknown origin and biological evidence of non-human intelligence that may be controlled by private persons or entities in the interest of the public good? As a citizen in this republic, I want to know why the senator, especially the majority leader, is thinks it's necessary to put that into public law. Like there should be a reason given for why we pass laws in this country, <laughs> and a law that says that that's saying the federal government, my federal government, shall exercise eminent domain over non-human intelligence and biological evidence thereof. I, I kind of want to know why you put that in law. I think that that's. There should be a sufficient, you know, public reason to justify that that in law. And we can speculate till the cows come home, but I just don't know why we're not asking Senator Schumer and his staff, like, 
you know, what the hell? <laughs> like, where did this come from? Yeah, I mean, I walk, I walk away from this with not a lot of certainty about anything. The one thing I think you, we can say without a shadow of a doubt, and you, you put your, your finger right on it, this is weird. Like, it's really weird. I'm not willing to come out and say, like, one thing or another, but, all, like, something weird is happening, and I don't understand it, and to your point, like, we should all be talking about it. Um, why don't we indulge in a little speculation, though, um, which is, what would be the geopolitical impact if any of this is even true? Like what, what, what happens? Like if, if we get tomorrow, here is the picture of the, the three foot tall body with the elongated head and the metallic looking cloak or whatever, like what happens the day after that photo is produced or that genetic evidence is produced? Anything, nothing like, would it have any impact? Would we all just start looting each other's like stores and things like that? Like how, how do you think about what that scenario looks like? So if I put myself in the position of, you know, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, the White House advisors um, like John Podesta, for example, that was trying to push for disclosure in previous administrations and is now a senior advisor to, 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 to Biden. And I'm trying to, like, plan a disclosure process that is tightly managed. One of the first considerations is, OK, there's got to be portions of this that we want to make public and there's portions of this that we don't want to make public, right? So like, I'll give you what I think is the most plausible scenario of where this comes public, assuming that, that something like the Grush story is true, right? Mm. Now, in that scenario, I don't think all of the Grush allegations will be part of that first package of disclosure, right? For example, I do not think we will come out and just say we have a whole bunch of like alien bodies and we don't know exactly, you know, how they're made and maybe their DNA and how close that DNA may or may not be to our DNA, for example. Like these things could get very weird very quickly and I don't think they're ready to have that conversation. Um, so I think it's more plausible to expect if this is the trajectory that we're on to have a controlled uh, disclosure plan, which by the way, that's the words that they use in the Schumer bill, it says a controlled disclosure plan <laughs> um, where they incrementally bring out these facts, right? The facts that we're at right now, which is that yes, these are real objects. Yes, they display these advanced capabilities. Yes, we've confirmed that no military or government on this planet makes them. So we strongly suspect that they are non-Earth origin. So that would be what I call like confirmation. At that point, I think they're trying to get to the, they're trying to get to the point where that's kind of like, there's like a wow shrug Right, where I don't expect there to be much of a official like market or geopolitical reaction if they play their cards right, right? Just like, you know, everyone just kind of goes, okay, well, what's next? I, I don't know what to buy or sell. I, I'm not ready to make change my plan or strategy as like a C-suite or as a military officer, right? So like the, the official sort of structure of, gov of human decision making, I don't think like materially changes because I don't think people have enough information to know like what to change in their investment or strategic decisions, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I think then you're in a different world though where there are some interesting possibilities that could develop, right? There's like, and to me there's like two, there's two main options, right? One is the like, okay, we're gonna try to use this for the purposes of broader social and geopolitical comedy, right? The sort of going back to Reagan, Gorbachev, you know, we're all one big human family. Our squabbles won't, won't go away. But now that we now that we know we're not the biggest kid on the block, maybe we need to think about, you know, what what our orientation is collectively towards this broader phenomenon that we can't necessarily control or defeat. So what do we do about that? That may tend to s suppress what would otherwise be potentially more volatile geopolitical flashpoints, e.g. Taiwan, right? So that if that's the scenario you're in, maybe you then have to discount the risk of a Taiwan invasion, for example, right? Because, you know, under that scenario, you know, there's other priorities and prerogatives that geopolitically take precedent. And it's easy to justify to domestic population in China, for example. Yeah, I know we promised the Taiwan, that like the Taiwanese unifi like sort of unification, but like we didn't factor in, you know, sort of the this whole the, thing. Yeah, yeah, we, and, you know, we, we, we totally didn't factor in that the three body problem was real. Yeah. <laughs> it allows, it allows a lot of governments to kind of reset the clock <laughs> on their political prop, on the political promises. But it also potentially possesses a, a risk to their legitimacy if because human beings are fundamentally social hierarchical creatures. We defer to, you know, governments because they're the most powerful things around. Right. Like kings are the most impressive in individuals. They control the most powerful instruments of power of 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 sort of state capability, if there's another entity out there that is now admitted by that government to have more power than it, 
sort of the sort of natural human social animal inclination is to sort of defer to that as the new authority. Okay, well, why do I have to listen to you? Like, let's. I, I, my job is to just try to channel whatever I think the alien being is telling me, kind of like the Lutheran Reformation, you know, undermining the authority of the, of the sort of ver- vertically integrated hierarchical structure of the Pope. Now anyone can have a direct relationship with God, right, and can sort of discern their own truth religiously through direct, you know, you know, interpretation of of the liturgy. Um, and that's a, that was a fundamentally destabilizing social and political force in Europe. You can imagine a similar version of that where people think, oh, the aliens are out there. They're floating in, you know, the ethereal whatever, right? And there's a whole bunch of people out there that can will probably tell you, you can commune directly with your new kind of God King alien that's floating around in space. And you don't need to listen to the to the government anymore. And the government's admitted that this thing is real. So, like, game set, right? Like that would be a fundamentally de- destabilizing thing for governments to like flirt with, knowing human psychology and how you know vulnerable we are to different cult belief systems. Um, that's kind of tricky. I don't. That's a very tricky thing to manage. You need to have. You would need to get the the broader apparatus of institutions, um, religious institutions, to kind of come on board and reestablish a kind of a new canonical worldview that everyone kind of accepts where the existing structures change a bit, but they're fundamentally still legitimate. Um, that's the most important thing I think they need to keep in, keep in mind. But that's like on the sociological side. For me, the more damaging, destructive side is on the technology end, right? Because this isn't just a matter of human belief at this point changing and the potential consequences for social and political order. It's, well, what new capabilities <laughs> like do we have you know, access to as a civilization that can fundamentally change you know, either the positive or negative potential for our lifespan (laughs) uh and you know as we've seen you know we talk about the sort of the um the lk99 like is it or isn't a room temperature superconductor the reason why that's such a fascinating question is because potentially if it's true that this this um this compound is an ambient temperature ambient pressure uh superconductor that dramatically opens up the aperture for technologies um that could fundamentally change the sort of the substrate of human civilization and you only get a few of those, right, in like, you know, in, in a few centuries. Um, and if it turns out that there's some of things like that, but like a few more that are like tucked away that could be unleashed on civilization, then we could be in a very, very different um, sort of forecasting position, right? Because now you have to, like, it's already, as you know, it's very, very difficult to forecast geopolitics with just nothing else changing, just like the normal human, you know, squabbles over resources and stuff. Throw in just like crazy advanced accelerating exponential technology and like out of left field step function jumps. And it's just like a complete scramble to the economic and political order. Um, uh, Yeah, I mean, I have to imagine at a certain point, it'll just be um, looking through a a mirror darkly. I hope that we that we take advantage of it if this is true, to try to like, you know, not we're not going to get world peace out of this, but at least we can like ameliorate some of our some of our tribal divisions. Um, but the sort of angst about technology um, competition, you know, I could easily see transitioning into this. And in fact, in the bill in the Senate Select Man Intelligence um, legislation, they they explicitly put this in there. It says like. In, it is the sense of Congress that, due to the increasing potential for technology surprise from foreign adversaries, and to ensure sufficient integration across the United States industrial base and avoid technology and security stovepipes, quote, the, the United States industrial base must retain its global lead in critical advanced technologies, and two, the federal government must expand awareness about any historical exotic technology antecedents previously provided by the federal government for research and development purposes. Essentially, what they're saying is, China's on the march, rapidly developing to the technology frontier. We are, have to like pull out all the stops to make sure we win in that competition. And now the Congress might have found out that there's like secret ace in the hole technologies that have been like locked away, that maybe Lockheed hasn't fully been able to um, exploit because they kept it so secret. So now we need to get more research and scientists from maybe big tech, academia, kind of in the in the tent to make sure that China doesn't get the jump on us. Because, for example, if by hypothesis China has some of these materials, they might have 10,000 engineers, you know, pouring over it. We might have like a thousand, right? And that that like 10 to 1 advantage like has to has to keep up some of the strategic planners like keep them up at night. It's like, what if trying to figure something out about this stuff before we do, right? Like, there's that that and that is a, a dynamic that I think, you know, in the security space, 
that always supervenes over any blah, 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 human story, one big family, yada, yada, yada. It's like, no, we need to get the most cutting edge technology or else. Well, I mean, to your point, I'm sure everybody's watching Oppenheimer now or thinking about Oppenheimer and nuclear weapons in general. I mean, I, I usually say this in some of my briefings and my speeches. I often talk about, I, I usually put up a, um, a picture of Niels Bohr's you know, description of the inside of the atom. And I talk about how Niels Bohr went into science and his biggest goal was he thought if he could find an inexhaustible energy source, there would be no more war and no more, no more poverty. And the next slide is always a mushroom cloud. And it says, so we took Niels Bohr's inexhaustible energy source and we made bombs out of it. So if you think that technological progress is going to lead to us all beating our swords into plowshares and singing Kumbaya, it usually doesn't work that way. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. human history doesn't show us that. But I'm, I'm glad you brought up the superconductor Thing because I've been thinking about that as well. And listeners might not even be familiar with it. I actually brought it up to some of the other research folks at CI. And I was, uh, usually I'm a little bit behind the curve when it comes to this stuff because I'm focusing more on, you know, underwater basket weaving and how it's affected by the coup in Niger. But, you know, I brought this up because I've been getting so many questions about this, the, the, the superconductor thing. And um, on the one hand, like, yes, it looks like there's some very interesting things that have happened. Maybe it'll pan out. Maybe it won't pan out. But there is sort of a gullibility in modern, it's not even modern society, going back hundreds of years, where we believe crazy shit. Like we burn witches at the stake because we think that they're communing with evil forces. Um, 5G causes COVID. Vaccines cause autism. Um, you know, you kind of go down the, we, we've got the superconductor. We've got the whole thing figured out. You can make it in your backyard in three days. It was all just waiting around for somebody to put the right things together. Like there, there's this gullibility um, in our society right now, which I guess has always been there, that we want to latch on to these glittering things to give meaning or to make sense out of life. I don't know. And, and part of me wants to throw everything that's happening into that bucket. But, you know, going back to the point about weirdness, there's just too much weirdness kind of to really, to really do that. But, but there is that, like w when we're talking about this, part of me is thinking, are the aliens just like playing chess and watching us all freak out? And then part of me is just like, man, the human capacity for hysteria really knows no bounds the fact that we're wasting our time here talking about aliens at all is like just an example of how much we've been infected by hysteria and i i don't know what to do with it all all, all i know is that it's weird <laughs> yeah and i think you see this across yeah i look for like like practical case studies of where i see a topic go from fringe niche like mm -hmm. sneering dismissal to now like center of policy discourse and one of them has been and it's like in keeping with this kind of like quasi-accelerationist technology weirdness. And it's an AI, obviously, right? Which mm -hmm. has been the one thing that if you look, say, 12 or 18 months ago, like the idea of there being like a, a major strategic policy discussion on like the risks, civilizational existential risks of runaway artificial general intelligence would have been like, oh, you're in sort of the less wrong blog world debating with a bunch of other nerds about like some <laughs> hypothetical scenario. And now you've got like, you know, meetings at the White House and major national summits being proposed and like big packages of legislation being discussed. Um, and that was pretty that's like pretty quick. That's like a, that was like a 12 month shift from being like, no, like you're a weirdo. Don't talk to me about that crazy thing. Go off on your Internet blog to like, can you come to the White House, please, and brief the, the brief the president on what you're on what you're worried about? Right. Like that tells me that, you know, at least, at least we should implicitly think that, you know, uh, again, it's like hard to like adjust your priors because not everything that, that's in that tail scenario is going to move into the center, right? And so it's like, where do you set the false positive threshold point, right? And COVID is another example, very different in terms of the, say, the characteristic dynamics of a virus spreading. But like, you know, if you were, say, more inclined to be like hyper reactive to like uh, a little signal and a, bra and, a large, and a large amount of noise, then, you know, you look at a few case counts coming out of Wuhan in January and you're like, I'm going to Costco. Right. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's two types of those people. There's like the person who's like deeply connected into the intelligence apparatus who has like deep sources and methods that are saying this is undercounted. There's a cover up underway. The government is treating this like it's a major problem. Like I'm going to tell my friends and family to like get ready. And then there's like the tinfoil hat guy who goes, you know, oh, the Chinese government this is a bioweapon. You know, it's coming out of the Wuhan lab. It's like, OK completely different motivations, maybe epistemically one grounded, one not so grounded, but they effectively did the same early proper decision making, right? Whereas like the midwit normie, no, until it comes to the New York Times, CNN headline, I, I just, I just, I'm just going to outsource my epistemic filter to these institutions where it, ha it will have to go through enough gates, you know, mm. of like, you know, other people concreting on the same idea for it to like be serious to me. 
And that's probably a safe strategy for most people, right? But if you're in the job of like anticipating events, if you're in the job of trying to prepare for those tail risk scenarios, you know, and advise people on the fact, you kind of have to always be looking at those like parts of the tails and you have to like really try to calibrate your, your sense of like, where's the signal in this noise and how early is too early to, to react to a little, a little hint, right? Um, and that's why I think the UAP conversation is like, it's, it's crossing over that threshold to me. Because I see these indicators, and I've been paying really close attention to them, and it's like, okay, it's not go, it's not becoming, it's not being treated any less seriously than than it was a year ago. In fact, it's like almost going becoming exponentially more serious mm-hmm. as a policy topic. And now it's like sort of entering into the normie discourse, being like, you know, a few like hits on on Sunday news programs and New York Times articles. It's like, okay, this is the characteristic you know pattern I would expect if for something to sort of go through this this evolution. Um, and so I think we're kind of moving that direction. And these other things are, haven't quite gotten there yet. So like the semiconductor one is like super very early on, right? It's a bunch of people on social media sharing preprints and you know rumors and like some you know picture of what is that thing actually levitating? Like what what is this? Oh wait, the, you know an hour ago, Argon National Lab just put put out you know uh, like a simulation that proves that um, that it has you know like these poly um, or sorry these like uh, Fermi bands, right? Where it's characteristic of 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 sort of superconductor behavior. Okay, like if like you could just ignore all that and wait for just wait for a few weeks, <laughs> and we'll probably know, right? Um, but if your job is to like try to figure out something immediately before everyone else does to try to capture the alpha, right? You might call this like um, you know like the like for example, I think um, our, our our buddy uh, the geopolitical alpha. Uh, <laughs> it's like you're trying to capture the sort of the epistemic alpha, um, the sort of the, 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 the sort of technological volatility alpha, or just like the weirdness alpha, um, then you kind of have to be really zoomed in uh, to those parts of the curve that are very murky. Um, and you're, you have to be comfortable kind of having a good set of epistemic heuristics that you refine over time and never pre-committing to a particular view because when you're out in the tails, it doesn't take a lot of information to change radically you know, what your assumptions are about the future. Um, no, it, I mean, methodologically, you're right. It's a very thin line between appearing absolutely deranged and actually doing the work of imagining something that everybody else thinks is silly. So, you know, usually when, when, you're, when we're talking about these sorts of things, if you're out in front for a long time, people will tell you that you're full of shit and you have no idea what you're talking about. And as Roger Baker, who's been on this podcast and training, nine out of 10 times, you'll be wrong. But like, if you're doing this discipline, you also have to have enough. It's weird. It's... um. Being an analyst, I find you need a remarkable combination of self-confidence and humility at the same time. You have to have enough self-confidence to record an hour and five minute podcast about the potential of aliens, but also enough humility to be at the end and say like, well, I don't know, <laughs> like, and, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong tomorrow. And I, I talked about what I talked about. And we got to move on to the next thing to imagine the future. Yeah, it's one of those things where depends on what your motivation is, right? If your motivation is to make a, a bet, if your motivation is to personally prepare psychologically, if your motivation is to engage policymakers or just intellectual curiosity, like you have to understand what your motivation is to investigate a question in the first place to know like what your standards of evidence need to be, right? If you're just a casual onlooker and your life isn't gonna change or any of your decisions are gonna change, then I think you should have a pretty high bar, right? <laughs> because you know, you don't need to make any radical decisions or changes in your lifestyle. You're just like, okay, if this is true, well then whatever happens, happens. I can't do anything about it, right? I'll just like react to it when it comes. Um, yeah. Maybe like in our jobs, right, you know, we have to like always look at those branches of the of the tree and be like, well, if, if the branch of the tree is this one, I have to look at that what if. Because then my clients are going to be calling me the next morning being like, okay, I ignored you on that alien thing for a while. But now that it's like for real, for real, like what the hell, right? And it's like, okay, I don't want to be like the, uh, that thinking about that for the first time, you know, when everyone else is, right? Um, uh, and it's just, you know, it's also a fascinating question, right? Like, of course, objectively speaking, it would be quite um, an, ont- an ontological shock if it were true. Stay tuned, I would say. Um, and read well, the bill. I- yeah. Well, yeah, read the bill. I, I don't know how much of a shock it would be. I mean, the odds are that we're not alone. The odds are that there are like living sentient civilizations out there or have been at some point or will be somehow. I mean, it just doesn't make sense that we're the maybe we're the only ones in this point in time or the only ones that technology allows us to travel between. You know, I, I don't know that it would change. The only thing that would change things if, if is if we have some kind of contact with a civilization that can interact with us or communicate with us or can control us in some kind of way, to your point about the benign 
um, you know, malevolent or, or even friendly sort of thing. If, if it's just, hey, like, this is a probe from some distant civilization that's been, you know, supernovaed, like, however many hundreds of millions of years ago, like, it's probably not going to change much. Which think, actually, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll finish on one, one speculative, semi-speculative point, which is on that exact inference, right? You have to, you have to, you have to follow, you have to follow that through line, right? The fact that you just made that claim that, yeah, if they acknowledge that these are non-human intelligence vehicles and, you know, nothing is dramatically going to shift in my worldview, well, then why haven't they admitted that fact? Just that fact alone, right? Unless it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and that it's not as simple as just saying, there's other advanced intelligence that's visiting from another planet. There could be other, other weirdness involved that might not be so easy to discuss on a mass scale. Um, and so, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's not, a, that's not a call a, like a, 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 a reassuring inference potentially. Um, so this is why I was saying like uh, the ontological shock might, is not just about whether are, are we alone or not. I think people have kind of accommodated themselves to that now. Right. Is, thousands of exoplanets we've discovered and it's just a matter of okay advanced physics to you know zip around the universe um it's a little bit more potentially of a nuanced um nuanced story it was if, if they're if they've been here how long have they been here how long have they been watching interacting manipulating like these are all the questions then you have you're forced to reckon with if you've accepted that first basic fact that they're here and they're real and they've been here for a while it's like, well, what have they been doing this whole time? <laughs> and that is a very uncomfortable set of questions that, you know, quickly gets you to the, you know, Alex Jones territory. And I don't think we're ready to do that right yet. No, probably not. Although I'm shocked that nobody in this discourse has, has brought up the, the most convincing evidence that aliens do exist, which is that Prince was on this earth for a while and gifted us with whatever his was music was in his head. So, Matt, we will wish you well on your journey and uh, we'll have you back in a couple of weeks, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for listening to the Cognitive Dissidents podcast brought to you by Cognitive Investments. If you are interested in learning more about Cognitive Investments, you can check us out online at cognitive.investments. That's cognitive.investments. Uh, you can also write to me directly if you want at jacob at cognitive.investments. Cheers, and we'll see you out there. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur.